Hello and welcome to Assistance Animals in Montana's Workplaces and Public Accommodations, a presentation by the Montana Human Rights Bureau. Assistance animals are service animals or emotional support animals. Service animals and emotional support animals are not pets. Service animals are either dogs or miniature horses and are individually trained to assist a person with a disability whereas emotional support animals are support or therapy animals. Miniature horses have many strengths that make them suitable as potential service animals. They are larger and stronger than a dog and also quite intelligent and possess excellent eyesight, making them excellent guide animals. Service dogs or miniature horses must be trained to provide a service to a person with a disability. Tasks performed can include, among other things, pulling a wheelchair, retrieving dropped items, alerting a person to a sound, reminding a person to take medication, or pressing an elevator button. On the slide here, you also see a list of specific examples of service animals and the tasks they have been trained to perform. For example, guide dogs, hearing, signal dog or miniature horse, psychiatric services, or seizure response animals. Emotional support animals, however, are not trained to perform a specific task and are therefore not considered service animals under the law. Emotional support animals may provide companionship, relieve loneliness, and sometimes help with depression, anxiety, and certain phobias but do not have special training to perform tasks that assist people with disabilities. They may be part of a medical treatment plan. However, a doctor's note stating a person needs the animal due to a disability does not turn an animal into a service animal. You may be asking why the difference in the definition between a service animal and emotional support animal matters. Sometimes people use terms or titles without knowing the legal ramifications of those terms or titles. People may call their animal a service animal or assistance animal when it's really a pet. These distinctions are important because they determine the amount of protections, rights, and responsibilities afforded to the owner of the animal. As seen here, typically service animals are afforded the most rights and protections. Next is emotional support animals, followed by pets. For the most part, whether you are talking about a housing provider, an employer, or a store, those places can institute their own policies regarding whether pets are allowed and there is no protection. Since the different types of categories seen here directly impact rights and responsibilities, it's important to understand the differences between these categories. In the sections that follow, we will talk about how these different categories are treated in the different protected areas like employment and public accommodations. Assistance animals are tied to discrimination because a person with a disability is entitled to a reasonable accommodation, whether at work or in public accommodations. And an assistance animal may be a reasonable accommodation for a disability. Now let's talk about how employers should address accommodating assistance animals, including both service animals and emotional support animals in the workplace. Persons with a disability are entitled reasonable accommodations in employment. A service animal may be considered a reasonable accommodation. When considering reasonable accommodations, the Bureau looks at four key points. Whether the person is a person with a disability, they have requested a disability accommodation, the two parties have engaged in an interactive process and either the accommodation was granted or denied based on an undue hardship. A person with any physical or mental impairment substantially limiting a major life activity may be considered a person with a disability. Thus, the definition of a disability is very broad. Any person with a disability may seek a reasonable accommodation from their employer. 
is a general rule that the employee must make the request. However, an exception to this rule exists if the person is unable to verbalize the request due to a disability. For example, a mental disability preventing communication or preventing them from understanding their rights to make a request. A request for accommodation can be extremely informal. There is no set method, format, or amount of paperwork required to request an accommodation and can be as simple as a conversation by the water cooler. There are no requirement for certain words to be made. The only trigger is that the employee expresses some type of medical condition impacting a job function. Be on the lookout for the combination of those two things so you don't miss a request for accommodation. Once the employer has identified an accommodation for disability is needed, both the employee and employer need to engage in what is called the interactive process. The interactive process should occur as soon as possible and should be done in good faith. The purpose of the interactive process is a dialogue and exchange of information between the employer and employee to identify an effective accommodation allowing the employee to overcome the workplace barrier experienced due to the disability. The interactive process is the employer's best friend. It is engaging in this process that allows an employer to ask questions and get confirmation that the employee is a person with a disability and information about the assistance animal. Without this process, in recovering this type of information, an employer will likely have a hard time building a defense in the event a discrimination complaint is filed against them. Whether we are talking about a service animal or an emotional support animal in the area of employment, these requests are handled the same as any other reasonable accommodation request at work. This is important because service animals and emotional support animals are treated very differently outside of employment. So whether you have someone asking for time off due to a disability, asking for a service animal due to a disability, or asking for an emotional support cat for a disability, you will go through the same process as an employer. A pointer is to think of a request for an assistance animal as a request for a modification to an employer's no pet policy. If an employer has such a policy, then it should grant the accommodation after engaging in the interactive process, unless allowing the assistance animal would pose an undue hardship. There is no policy in place prohibiting pets. If the employer allows other employees to bring in their pets without jumping through hoops, then it should also allow the employee with a disability to bring in its disability-related pet without jumping through hoops. Because if there's no policy requiring a modification and an employer allows employees without disabilities to bring in animals, then making an employee with a disability go through the interactive process means the employer is treating the employee with a disability less favorably by making them go through a process that others without a disability do not have to go through. That in itself is discrimination, regardless of whether the employer allows the animal or not. During the interactive process, an employer may request reasonable amounts of information related to the person's disability or medical condition. The type of documentation an employer is looking for typically comes from letters from healthcare providers. The letters can be from doctors, nurses, or therapists. These providers are usually in the best position to be able to verify the employee is a person with a disability who would benefit from having an assistance animal. When dealing with service animals specifically, you may need to accept documentation other than a healthcare provider to confirm the animal has been individually trained. As you can imagine, healthcare providers probably won't have info about the service animal's training. So this type of document may come in the form of a certificate from training or a letter from a trainer. To verify training for a service animal, an employer can also ask an employee to demonstrate the task the service animal is trained to perform for the benefit of the disability experienced by the employee. It is reasonable for the employer to ask the employee to bring the animal in for this type of demonstration and to show the animal can behave and not be a disruption while in the environment of the workplace. Service animals are working animals. They should be trained to be housebroken and under the employee's control. Emotional support animals, however, are not trained. Their presence is the assistance they provide the employee. 
the employee may still be asked to provide documentation that establishes a medical condition and how the emotional support animal benefits that medical condition. Furthermore, emotional support animals should not be disruptive to the workplace. Whether it's a service animal or emotional support animal, trial periods are highly recommended. If an assistance animal is unruly and the employee cannot maintain control of the animal, or the animal is aggressive, the employer will have specific individualized reasons for denying the request for the assistance animal as an accommodation. The final key point when an employer is dealing with a request for an assistance animal in the workplace is the decision to grant or deny the accommodation request. An employer is not required to provide the disability accommodation requested by the employee. If the interactive process identifies another, less burdensome accommodation, the employer can choose to implement that accommodation instead of the one preferred by the employee. The only requirement for an employer who does this is that it must ensure that the alternative accommodation it provides is effective to overcoming the workplace barriers. However, assistance animals are unique and can often provide support not found in other accommodations, such as security and independence. Employers should keep this in mind when evaluating whether an alternative accommodation is actually effective. An employer can deny a reasonable accommodation under certain circumstances, often referred to as an undue hardship. For an accommodation to be an undue hardship, the employer must show that allowing or implementing an accommodation would cause significant difficulty or expense. Following these tips should it help an employer develop an undue hardship defense should it need one down the road. First, an employer should make sure it is explaining why it is denying a request for an assistance animal to the employee. This would be considered part of the interactive process because the idea is that the explanation may give the employee an additional opportunity to provide more information or documentation to help the employer understand the need or request. Employers should make sure they are doing their best to document the interactive process and alternative accommodations discussed. This can be an email summarizing meetings and next steps. It can be a memo drafted after meetings as well. The key is documenting the interaction, basics of the contents of the communications, and identifications of what next steps are for those involved in the interactive process. For example, if you have a meeting and discuss the need to verify the employee's disability, when you document it, make sure you are saying that the employee is going to follow up with the medical provider to get documentation, and once that is received, another meeting will be scheduled. If an employer decides not to grant an accommodation, it should make sure it documents the specific reasons it is denying the specific animal at issue. The employer cannot base the denial on generalizations, like some animals are aggressive, so we can't have that dog in here. The reasons for the denial must be based on the specific animal at issue. Be prepared to explain how having the assistance animal would have been unduly disruptive or negatively impact the ability to conduct business. Now we will switch gears and discuss accommodating assistance animals in public accommodations. The definition of a public accommodation covers a wide variety of businesses, such as inns, restaurants, taverns, resorts, hospitals, golf courses, and campgrounds. Some people seem to get confused between a public accommodation and a reasonable accommodation. A public accommodation is basically a business, while a reasonable accommodation is what a patron of the business would be asking for in order to have their assistance animal present with them while in the business. The Montana Code has specific protections for service animals. It should be noted that emotional support animals were specifically excluded from these protections by our state legislature. So unlike employment, where an employer goes through the same process, whether it's a service animal or emotional support animal, in public accommodations, the definition and difference between a service animal or emotional support animal is paramount. Under the statute, be aware that public accommodations cannot require a customer provide documents that prove its dog or miniature horse is a service animal. If a person comes into a business establishment with a dog or miniature horse, there are only two questions the business can ask. 
first, whether the service animal is required because of a disability, and second, to describe the service the animal has been trained to perform. The establishment cannot ask what the individual's disability is. For example, in one service animal case, a patron at a bar was told his dog was not allowed upon entering. When the patron explained the dog is a service animal, the bartender retorted that his dog was not wearing a vest. The bartender acknowledged during the Bureau's investigation that he had told other patrons to leave if they did not have papers or a vest for service animals that entered the bar. The patron in this case was pretty smart in getting the bartender to write down on paper that he was being denied service because he had no proof of his dog's status as a service animal prior to leaving the establishment. After an investigation, this was a cause finding because public accommodations cannot require documentation or certificates that prove an animal is a service animal. It should also be noted that a public accommodation cannot ask that the animal physically demonstrate what it does for the person with a disability. This is another way a public accommodation is different than an area of employment. A person with a disability has the right to be accompanied by a service animal in all public accommodations without being charged extra for the service animal. However, a person with a service animal, whether fully trained or in training, has the responsibility of paying for any damage the service animal may cause. Additionally, a person without a disability is afforded these same rights and responsibilities if he or she is training a service animal. However, by statute, a service animal in training must wear a leash, collar, cape, harness, backpack, or some type of writing that identifies that the animal is a service animal in training and the identification must be visible and legible from at least 20 feet away. The following changes were made to the Montana Code in 2019 regarding service animals. A person may be asked to remove a service animal if it is not housebroken or if the animal is not under control and the person has not taken effective action to control the animal. However, the person must be given an opportunity to stay without the animal's presence. If a public accommodation posts a sign that animals are prohibited, it must also indicate that service animals are permitted. In addition, a person who misrepresents an animal as a service animal can be asked to remove the animal from the premises and local law enforcement may be called to investigate. Misrepresenting an animal as a service animal in order to access a public accommodation with the animal can be a misdemeanor under certain circumstances. Regarding emotional support animals, the state law that outlines the specific protections for service animals explicitly states that emotional support animals are not service animals. However, state law also provides that persons with disabilities are entitled to reasonable accommodations in public accommodations. Therefore, the best practice is to engage in the interactive process regarding the emotional support animal to determine if allowing the emotional support animal in a public accommodation is reasonable or if it would pose an undue burden or fundamentally alter the way business is conducted. Remember, if a public accommodation allows animals unrelated to a disability on the premises, it must allow animals related to a disability. Otherwise, it is treating persons with disabilities less favorably. Furthermore, the conduct of the emotional support animal is always relevant, same as the conduct of a service animal, and can be a cause to ask for its removal. Emotional support animals can be held to these same conduct standards. They must be held under the owner's control, not jumping around, barking, or being aggressive. Not being housebroken is also a deal breaker for service animals and emotional support animals. When dealing with requests for service animals in public accommodations, listen to what the animal owner says before rushing to judgment. How do they identify the animal? Did they offer information on why they need the animal? It's important to know the difference between a service animal and an emotional support animal. If the owner isn't offering info or you have doubts, assume it is a service animal and keep to the two permissible questions. The answers to those questions tell you the animal is not a service animal, but is needed for a disability. Communicate with the owner to see if the emotional support animal can be accommodated.